The land down under has never been easier to reach. United Airlines has more flights between the U.S. and Australia than any other U.S. airline, so you can fly nonstop to destinations like Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane. Explore dazzling cities, savor the very best of Aussie cuisine, and get up close and personal with the wildlife. Who doesn't want to hold a koala? Go to united.com slash Australia to book your adventure. This is Jeff Billard from the Amigos Audio Collective, thanking you for listening to the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Welcome to Chronosphere Fiction. This is your pilot, Daniel French. On this flight through the spectral streams, we will be traveling back to the world of Patricia Keeler's Beyond the Wall, part three of three. So relax as we take you back to the city of Eden, far into the future. Matt is with a group of about 20 other people. They are crossing the wildlands. It is dark. They have only flashlights to guide them and the moonlight. First, they walk across the marshy land, then through the forest. They find the tunnel and walk through it. As they approach the end of the tunnel and switch off their flashlights, they come out the other side. They are confronted by Walter Stedman and a group of his men. Arrest these men. Take this scum away and lock them up. Senator Charles Taylor is sitting with the other senators in a large hall where the senators meet. The senators are discussing the raid of the previous night. Last night... A group of hornets entered our city with the intention of stealing more food. This is the second time this has happened, and it won't be the last unless we do something. What do you suggest, Senator Fortescue? I say we attack them. We teach them a lesson. There is no need to attack them. The Harnots would not be adventuring into our city unless they were desperate. Why don't we help them? Give them some of our food supplies. Senator Taylor, I appreciate your concern, but these people lack the intelligence and moral fiber. So how will they ever learn to stand on their own feet if they think they will always be there to sort out their problems when times get hard? You totally underestimate the Harnots. They would not be doing this if their crops hadn't failed this year, and most likely for several years before this. You forget that they don't have the resources we have, so everything is grown and farmed the old-fashioned way. They depend on good harvest for their food. Enough, Senator Taylor. You seem to think stealing is acceptable. They kidnapped one of our young women, too, recently. Fortunately, she was brought back. If you mean Megan Clark, they didn't kidnap her. They rescued her. I've been told she was kidnapped. I have spoken to her myself, and I can absolutely confirm that she wasn't kidnapped. And we're to believe this, are we? It's a well-known fact that you are a harnet lover, a liberal with a misplaced sense of loyalty and justice. Your refusal to see the Harnots for what they truly are is quite disturbing, Senator Taylor. I vote for a surprise attack on the Harnots. I also say that we hang the 20 Harnots who dared to enter our city last night. Who is with me on this? You can't attack poor defenseless people and you can't hang those young men. That amounts to murder, Senator Fortesque. I disagree. I think that a show of strength may well be necessary to stop these vile creatures from stealing our food and our young women. If we don't take a stand, we will be raided continuously by them. And I suspect that we will soon find many of our young women are lured to the slums. 
perhaps in an attempt to breed with them and improve their bloodline. Well said, Senator Browning. I couldn't have put it better myself. Now, who is with us on this? Raise your hands if you're in agreement. You can't do this. This is wrong. Arrest Senator Taylor and put him under house arrest. Ministry High Command, Commander Vera Anderson's office. I'm very pleased with you, Officer Stedman. You have done an excellent job arresting the Harnot Raiders. Yes, Commander Anderson. I think the whole situation has played very nicely into our hands. The attempted raid on our food supplies has given us the pretext to attack the Harnots, and with people believing that the young girl Megan was actually kidnapped by the Harnots, we'll be able to attack them without any dissent. Only that bleeding heart Senator Taylor seems bothered, and he's under house arrest. A stroke of luck that the leader of the Harnot Raiders was Megan's boyfriend. People will be even more keen to see the Raiders punished if they think that the young man's guilty of kidnapping one of our girls. I don't think we could have planned it better ourselves. So when are we launching the attack? In about a week, Commander. And what about the execution? At about the same time as the attack. We want the two events to coincide. Very well. I will leave it up to you to make the necessary arrangements for both the attack and the execution. In Megan's apartment with her parents. I've decided to agree to being found a ministry job and to accept the husband chosen for me. Oh, darling, I'm so glad. I knew you'd see sense in the end. It's not a question of seeing sense, ma'am. I've just decided that it's pointless to resist. It's pointless fighting. You'll see, in five years' time, when you're lovely and settled, all of this will seem like childish nonsense. You are unbelievable, ma'am. You call hanging the man I love and attacking his people childish nonsense? I see you're not over this silly, unsuitable infatuation. It's not a silly infatuation. And no, you're right. I will never get over it. I just hope the husband you have chosen can get these rebellious ideas out of your head. I'm marrying the person they choose for me. Isn't that enough? I will never love him. I don't want to love him. Then why agree to it, Megan? Because I don't have a choice, do I? If I say no, then I will be an outsider. I won't get a decent home or job. People who don't fit the mold in this society get cast aside. You play the game or you're out. Your father and I played the game and things turned out okay for us. But what about Marianne and all those people who played the game only to find that they're not okay? I hate Eden what it is, what it's become. Commander Vera Anderson's office. How are the plans going for the attack on the Harnots? I'm afraid there's been a bit of a setback. What sort of setback? Well, some of my officers have reported sick. What's wrong with them? Some sort of bug, I think. Really? That's very strange. I didn't realize we still caught bugs. Is it some sort of cold bug? I suppose so. Well, keep me updated, won't you? Will do, Commander. Damn it. I was really hoping to get the attack underway. Outside Senator Charles Taylor's apartment. I'd like to see Senator Taylor. Well, you can't. He's under house arrest and you don't get to see him unless you've got special permission. Please, it's really important. I said no. I just want to ask him something. I'll be five minutes, that's all. Five minutes, you say? Don't you recognize her, mate? She's that bloody girl who went missing. Then they found her again. She'd been living with the hornets and now they say she's not quite right in the head. I'm not going to let her get anywhere near Taylor. They're both heretics and troublemakers. Go on. 
Get out of here. Please. If you don't get away from me right now, I'll shoot. Commander Vera Anderson's office. I trust your men have all recovered, Officer Stedman? I'm... I'm afraid not, Commander. Are you telling me they've got worse? They're, um... They're dead. They've died? Yes. Have they discovered what caused their deaths? Samples are being sent to the labs. Well, keep me posted about this, Officer Stedman. Yes, Commander. Meg in his parents' apartment. Very well. I'll go and try it on. Megan goes over to the mirror and stares at her reflection unhappily. She goes to her drawer and pulls out a small triangular-shaped bottle with the word Calma in large printed letters. And in the equally large print, do not take more than recommended dose. Megan opens the bottle. She starts sobbing. She pours out a big handful of pills into her hand. With a trembling hand, she takes the glass of water on her desk and is about to take the pills. Megan stares at the handful of pills as if frozen. Then she throws the pills on the floor. It is clear that she had decided to commit suicide, but has then changed her mind. Commander Vera Anderson's office. Officer Stedman, please tell me that the news I'm reading online isn't true. I'm afraid it is. More and more people are dying from this mysterious bug. Haven't the chaps at the science ministry worked out what it is yet? I mean, surely it's not beyond them to discover what it is and find a vaccine or something. The trouble is that most of the people at the science ministry are dead or dying themselves. Are you saying that this is unstoppable? That's pretty much exactly what I'm saying. How... how long have we got? At the rate it's spreading right now, less than a week. Less than a week? As for me, I think probably much less. You see, I already have the symptoms. So, this is the end, then? It would appear so, Commander. It would appear so. At Megan's parents' apartment. The Ministry of Safety has issued an order for everyone to remain in their apartment. It's because of this damned illness everyone's talking about. I'm scared, Jonathan. Half the city is dead or dying. My sister messaged me to say that her whole family is very, very ill. Do you think they all might die? I don't know, Judith, dear. I really don't know. Do you think we're going to die too? I don't know, Judith, but it's possible. Either way, our world, this world, Eden, is at an end. I'm just sad that we may not live to see our future or Megan's future. Senator Charles Taylor is in his apartment. He looks out of his window down onto the street below. On the streets, vehicles have crashed. There are people lying motionless on the ground and some crazed looking people running in and out of buildings, carrying either things they have stolen or knives, batons, and other weapons. He walks towards the front door and it slides open. He peers out nervously. His two guards are lying crumpled by the wall, dead. Senator Taylor walks to the elevator. He steps out onto the ground floor where he sees a gang of men breaking into another apartment. One of the men is carrying a knife. When the knife-carrying man sees Senator Taylor, he runs up to him. Senator Taylor then notices that the man looks ill and crazed. The looter then lunges for him. Hey, hey. Uh, ah, ah, Christ, you were saint! Ah, ah. Senator Taylor runs away and just manages to get back to the lift in time. 
He goes back to his apartment and finds the first aid box in the bathroom. He disinfects and bandages his own leg and limps back over to the window. The door of Commander Vera Anderson's office slides open. Walter Stedman stumbles in, clearly very unwell. He approaches Commander Anderson's desk. She is slumped over her desk, dead. Walter Stedman sits down, takes her hand in his. It has been an honor working for such a fine woman, Commander. I only wish I had told you this when you were still alive. But who could have imagined a week or so ago that... But who could have imagined a week or so ago that Eden could end so quickly? The end has come so unexpectedly. Neither of us could have foreseen this. Farewell, my splendid commander. Megan Clark's parents' apartment. Both of Megan's parents are lying down on their beds, looking very ill. Megan is sitting on a chair between them. Megan, your father and I were dying. But maybe you might be okay. You're not sick for some reason. You're not sick. Promise me that if you survive, you... Please, Mom, don't talk. You need to save your energy. You mustn't exhaust yourself. I'm going to die anyway. If, if you live, promise me that you will try to build a new life somewhere. You, you know that we only ever wanted the best for you, Megan. Dad! Dad! Oh, my God, Mom, he's dead! Oh, Daddy! Daddy! Megan turns to her mother, only to discover that she, too, has passed away. Megan sobs uncontrollably for a while, then she covers her parents' bodies with sheets. Still in tears, she packs a rucksack with a few things, some clothes, some food, a knife, etc. She then takes one final look at her parents and leaves the apartment. Megan approaches Senator Charles Taylor's apartment. She sees the two dead guards and rings the doorbell anxiously. For a moment, there is no sound from within, and Megan is almost about to turn around and walk away. Then, she hears a voice. Who? Who is it? Senator Taylor, it's me, it's Megan. What happened to your leg, Senator? I heard some noises in the building. I went to have a look to see what was going on, and I got attacked by some looters. Are you okay? I'm all right, I can walk on it. Everyone is either dead or dying, Senator. I don't understand what's happening. Well, I can't be certain, but I've looked up the symptoms, and I think what's killing everyone is a particularly fast-acting form of smallpox. I've never heard of smallpox. Smallpox was virtually wiped out in the 20th century. But it looks like it's returned somehow. Only this time, the normal incubation period is much shorter. That's why people have died so quickly. But I'm not ill, and neither are you. Odd, isn't it? Didn't you say you thought your father was a harnet? Yes, possibly. Well, what if the harnets have a natural resistance or immunity to smallpox? And if your father was a harnet, maybe he passed it on to you. That's right, and it finally answers my question about my father. But what about you? Maybe... I'm just taking longer to get sick. 
I need to find out some more information about smallpox. Senator Taylor takes out his pocket computer and scrolls down some information on a page. I think I may have found the reason why you're not ill, Megan. What is it? Did you come into contact with any animals during your stay in the slums? Yes, plenty. Matt works on a farm. Why? Well, it says here that some animals get a thing called cowpox. Cowpox belongs to the same family as smallpox. It can be passed on to humans, and exposure to cowpox can offer immunity against the far more virulent smallpox. So you are saying that exposure to cowpox has made me immune? That's just what I'm saying, Megan. But that means that everyone else in this huge city is either dying or dead. Everyone except us and your young man and his friends. We've got to release them. I've already got a bag packed. I was planning to leave before you came. Are you okay to walk? Don't worry about me, Megan. I can hobble my way out of here. I'm ready when you are, Senator. Let's go. Megan Clark and Senator Taylor go out into the streets. There are many dead people lying in the street. Abandoned vehicles are everywhere. There are still a few sick people stumbling around. Megan and Senator Taylor see an abandoned vehicle with its doors open. Senator Taylor hauls out the dead person in the driver's seat. Quickly, get in! The car rises into the air and flies over the city to Ministry High Command. Prison cells are in the basement. They enter the lift that takes them down to the cells. Once down there, they search for the special mechanism which unlocks all the cell doors. I found it! She presses a set of buttons which releases all the inner cell doors when releasing all the prisoners. Matt is the first person to reach Megan. Oh my god, Megan! I thought you were dead! Oh, thank god you're all right! They kiss as the lights in the building begin to flicker on and off. Hey, guys, I really think we need to be getting out of here. Senator Taylor's right. The power is beginning to fail. Is there another exit? Yeah, we were brought over here along uh, that long corridor over there. Megan, Matt, his men, and Senator Taylor are all outside in the streets. It is evening and lights are flickering on and off everywhere. We need to leave this place as soon as possible. Power is failing. Soon everything will be in darkness. Can we steal some cars like we did earlier? No. They'll be losing power too. We wouldn't want to lose power mid-flight. We'll just have to walk then. Let's head towards one of the service tunnels in the wall. They approach the greenhouse near the wall at the edge of the city. Megan. You and Senator Taylor should wait here outside the greenhouse. Can't I go in with you? No, you should stay here and wait with the senator. He's looking a bit tired and pale. There's quite a bit of blood. Matt and his men enter the greenhouse and fill their backpacks with food. They are walking along the service tunnel with flashlights. Senator Taylor is holding on to Megan and Matt. He is limping badly and looks quite tired and ill. They exit the tunnel and enter the wildlands. Once in the forest, it's dark. Don't you think we should rest for the night, Matt? Oh, I don't know. The senator's lost quite a bit of blood. It's pretty weak. If we rest for the night, we will even make it tomorrow. If we rest for the night, he'll have lost even more blood by the morning. Please leave me. I don't think I can make it. I'm not leaving the senator alone here to die in the woods. I've already lost my parents. I'm not losing Senator Taylor. He's been like a father to me. Right. I want everyone to collect as many branches, leaves, and other useful bits. We're going to build a stretcher. They get busy collecting tree branches, leaves and using anything they can find in their bags, such as rope, to construct a makeshift stretcher. They then gently lift Senator Taylor onto the stretcher and begin their journey through the forest. 
As they reach the marchlands, the sun begins to rise. They walk into the slums. People rush out of their houses to greet them. Oh my God, Matt and Megan, we were so worried about you all. Everyone in Eden is dead. My parents, everyone. My sister, Sarah, and my parents are, are they dead? I'm, I'm afraid so, Evelyn. Oh. How do they all die? A very fast-acting strain of smallpox. I am immune because of the time I spent here on Matt's farm, and the senator here is immune because he's half harnut. He's, he's half heart nut? Who's his father? An older gentleman suddenly pushes through the crowd. This is Nathaniel Jackson. He approaches the stretcher and Senator Taylor. Charles? Father, is that you? Oh my God! Charles! My son! I never thought I'd ever find you. Get this man to a hospital right away. He's lost a lot of blood. Everyone is sitting around a large table in Matt's living room, eating a sumptuous-looking meal. Matt, Megan, Evelyn, and her husband, Adam, Senator Taylor, and Nathaniel Jackson are all there. It is six months after the main events of this story. So, Senator Taylor, how are you now? I've almost fully recovered, thank you, Evelyn. I've been told that I might always walk with a bit of a limp, but it's a small price to pay for just being alive and just being here with all of you. And please, Evelyn, do call me Charles. Charles is going into business with Nathaniel. I've got some news to tell you all, too. I'm engaged. Oh, my God, Megan, that's wonderful news. Have you set a date for the wedding yet? Yes, Matt and I are getting married at the end of June. Well, I think this calls for a special toast. To the happy couple. Evelyn, will you be my maid of honor? I thought you'd never ask. And Charles, will you give me away? I would be very honored, Megan. Oh, you're going to the inauguration of our first town mayor. Oh, everyone. A stage has been erected in the town square. Bunting has been put up. Chairs have been placed in rows by the stage. The square looks bright and cheerful and quite festive. This is Mayor John Wormhurst. I'm extremely honored to have been chosen as this town's first mayor. I feel that out of great tragedy and death, a new life for us all has begun. Mankind took a foolish path back in the 21st century, a path which has been led to great inequality and unfairness. But now we have been given a second chance, a chance to build a new world order, a chance to build a better future for ourselves and our children. We will return to Eden once the stench of death and decay has left that place, and we will find that this is worthy of being kept and maintained. We will bring it back here and use it to improve our lives. There are many innovations which we should like to keep and use, but we will learn from Eden's mistakes, too. We will not become slaves to the machine. And for too long, this town and others like it have been known as the slums. It is the name we were given by the inhabitants of Eden so they could look down on us. It is a new dawn. So I therefore name this town Aurora, a name that means the dawn. And that wraps up part two of three from Beyond the Wall, written by Patricia Keeler. Megan Clark was Deborah Cristobal. Judith Clark and Vera Anderson were Napoleon Doom. Jonathan Clark is Frank Gugliamelli. Eliza Greenway, Marion Peters, and Sarah Markham are Rosanna Jimeno. Juliet Luther is Megan Soloff. 
Walter Stedman, Simon Peters, and Josh Layton are played by Pete Lutz. Matt Hargraves, Senator Edwin Fortesque, and Principal Klingman are Blake Benlin. Linda Peters is played by Cindy Stevens. Senator Charles Taylor is played by Spencer James Frederick. Evelyn Markham is Caitlin Curtis. Please help out Chronosphere Fiction by downloading as many episodes as you can. Subscribe and become a patron at patreon.com slash chronosphere or send a buck via Venmo at at Fishbonius. Thank you for flying on Chronosphere Fiction. Until next time, keep your cosmos clean. Not adjust your sets. You're tuned to Wednesday Wonders on the Mutual Audio Network. Tomorrow on Mutual is Thursday Thrillers, our roundup of action, adventure, mystery, crime, drama, and thrillers, of course. Subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed for every day of diverse audio tales. Or find the Thursday Thrillers feed in your favorite podcast players. This is the Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.